My name is Professor Seth Lazar. I'm at the ANU. I'm a, a project lead of the Humanizing Machine Intelligence Project. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all. And I'd like to start by acknowledging that this is National Sorry Day, a day set aside to recognize the injustices suffered by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people at the hands of white settlers, and in particular to recognize the stolen generations. It's also the third anniversary of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, I'd like to associate myself and the project that I lead with that movement for justice and reconciliation. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm recording today on Ngunnawal lands and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So I'm joined today um, by Dr. Catherine Kemp, Senior Lecturer at UNSW Law, Associate Professor Vanessa Teague of Thinking Cybersecurity and the ANU, um, Dr. Mary Scheel, uh, Field Epidemiologist from the ANU School of Population Health, and Associate Professor James Wood, an applied mathematician from the School of Public Health and Community Medicine at UNSW. They're an inordinately talented bunch with many feathers to their caps, um, but our time is limited, so I'll trust you to read up on their profiles listed in the advertisements for this event. So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna give an introduction. Um, we're then going to um, go through a series of questions with the panelists. Um, our aim is to get through all of those, all of the, co cover all of the ground within an hour, um, we're going to be, um, we, you can put questions in the Q&A as we go along, um, but what we'll do is we'll address them after the hour uh, for those who can stay around. We just didn't think we could get through all the material and then do a separate Q&A. The, um, the video of, the, um, of this webinar will be broadcast on the ANU TV uh, YouTube channel as soon as we're able to get it up. Um, and um, that's all. So, okay, let's start by introducing the webinar. So in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we know that total elimination of the virus in Australia is most likely impossible and that we can't all remain locked down forever. So there's seemingly no alternative to test, trace, isolate and quarantine and support. So this approach enables us to target quarantine at those most likely to otherwise spread the virus and so keep the total caseload manageable while we wait for a vaccine or else simply learn to live with a new seasonal disease. So contact tracing is a key part of our long-term plan for managing the pandemic. That's nothing new. Appointing disease detectives to track the movement of a virus and try to break chains of transmission is Public Health 101. But this is one of the first pandemics to occur in the era of the smartphone, when a large proportion of the population of countries like Australia have a device that they take with them practically everywhere, which is capable of both tracking their location and tracking the other devices they come into contact with. Apps like COVID-Safe don't track location. They use Bluetooth to detect when other devices run in the app are nearby. They broadcast a unique ID um, and scan to identify the IDs of other devices, while also sharing details about what make and model of phone they're running on. From this data, we can estimate how close the phones were and the duration of their contact. Contact tracers are particularly interested in people who were close contacts of an infected person i.e. within one and a half meters for 15 minutes or more. So how could this information help contact tracing? So we can now draw a distinction between two different approaches that you might take to using apps to support um, contact tracing. So let's call the first one app-enhanced traditional contact tracing. So on this approach, if a person with the app tests positive, they share their data with the health authority, allowing contact tracers to integrate it into their other research. The contact tracer can use data from their app to help identify possible close contacts who now need to self-quarantine. In cases of community transmission, that data can also help identify from whom that person caught the disease. And in the aggregate, the data can help us to track the epidemiology of the disease. So the second approach, which is now enabled by a new update to Apple and Google's operating systems that was rolled out last week, is called exposure notification. So on this approach, the goal is primarily to empower people with information that they've been exposed to risk. But it ensures that neither the health authority nor the apparently at risk person ever knows just which positive test is connected to which contacts. According to the Apple, user document, Apple and Google documentation, if a user is notified through their app that they've come into contact with an individual who's positive for COVID-19, then the system will share the day the contact occurred, how long it lasted, and the Bluetooth signal strength of the contact. No other information about the contact will be shared. So in particular, there will be no way, and it's explicitly precluded, that you should link the person who's been notified of exposure to the particular person who tested positive. So COVID-Safe was obviously launched in haste. 
uh, when we didn't know how successful our physical distancing measures would be. Without waiting for the Apple and Google framework, um, some design choices were made that led to some pretty significant functionality, privacy, and security vulnerability. Some of those were addressed by very quickly passed legislation a couple of weeks ago. Um, the data that's generated by the app has been called by some the most protected data in, the, uh, in Australian history. By the way, I should point out that as a, someone who's emigrated to Australia is now an Australian citizen, I keep slipping between saying data and data. Um, data is the proper way to say it, but there you go. Um, so other, others of the flaws have been um, addressed in some subsequent updates. And if you have the app and you haven't updated it, you absolutely should. So still though, the Australian open source community believes that there's really no way to close the remaining security holes without rewriting the app to use the new Apple and Google architecture. But that wouldn't just be a very significant technical change. It would involve different functionality too. However, at present, the app isn't getting a lot of use. Community transmission remains low, and we're able to trace almost all contacts without using app data. As far as we know so far, there's only been one contact who's actually been traced through using the app. Now, that shouldn't be viewed as a failing of the app. It shouldn't be a signal that there's a problem. Um, because it's rather a sign that we're doing pretty well with respect to the virus. The purpose of the app is to help should there be a second wave of infections. Um, but it does mean that we possibly have time to make a big change if we have to. We're effectively at a turning point. We have 6 million people who've downloaded the app. That's the kind of greatest uptake of such an app um, so far in any country. Um, so will COVID save switch to the new Apple and Google framework? And so to the new functionality. Um, or will we try and create a workaround? And at the end of the day, who's going to decide? So those are the questions that we want to ask. I'm going to switch now to sort of unspotlight my video, if I'm able to figure out how to do that. Okay, cancel the spotlight video. Um, and hopefully you're seeing us in gallery view. I'm going to see if I can find, um, let's see, we still haven't got Vanessa. So I'm just going to look for her. Still not there. Okay, so while I'm doing this, I'm just gonna, so I've got um, Shelley Adamson from the ANU is here with me. Um, Shelley, can you find um, Vanessa's phone number and call her? I've already, I'm okay. yeah. Um, all right, so we're gonna try and proceed and um, if, if we can't get hold of Vanessa, then, then um, so be it. So to better understand COVID safe and to answer these questions and more, I'm gonna call on the panel for their views. Um, one thing I would really appreciate, if you are watching this and you notice that the, um, the spotlight isn't following the person who's speaking, um, please flag that in the Q&A, because from our side, we can't tell at the moment, all I can see is that the yellow, um, little yellow highlight is around Catherine. Um, okay, so um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask first about how contact tracing works and what the evidence is in support of using smartphones to help with contact tracing. I'm then going to ask about the privacy risks associated with this kind of surveillance. We'll then shift to looking at how government has sought to mitigate those risks using both law and code uh, before considering the prospects of a shift to Apple and Google's decentralized architecture and what steps we'll take next. And then at 12 o'clock, um, we'll start answering questions from the Q&A. Okay, so first off, um, let's get some more detail on how contact tracing works and on what the evidence in support of using smartphones to help contact tracing looks like. So here I'm going to start by asking Dr. Mary Shield. So Mary, um, can you tell us a bit more about how traditional contact tracing works? Um, in particular, it'd be helpful to hear about um, the sort of the forward-looking and the backward-looking dimensions of contact tracing. Um, and maybe you could tell us a bit how forms of technology are currently being used in order to support contact tracing kind of prior to um, things like COVID safe. Thanks, Seth. Um, you've nicely summarised what contact tracing is in the introduction, so I won't go too much into detail, and um, I'm hoping that a lot of the attendees already understand large elements of contact tracing because of the media discussions in the last few months. But essentially, the main purpose of how we understand contact tracing is to disrupt transmission, which means what we want to do is prevent a person who has the disease to give it to other people, also those people who might have been exposed to an infected person, don't go and pass it on to other people. That's the main purpose of contact tracing is to disrupt the chains of transmission. And so 
one of the things that when the first step, what you do is when a person identifies or is tested positive for a particular disease, and this is again to say that this is contact tracing is not a new thing. We do it for most infectious diseases that can cause outbreaks like measles, like tuberculosis. And so when a person tests positive for a particular infection, um, they get a call from public health authorities after they've been notified of their test result, usually by their general practitioner because they often have a relationship with them. And then a health authority or epidemiologist will call them and do a case interview, get consent, um, do a proper assessment of um, what their situation is. But as part of that interview and case investigation, they also seek consent and ask them for the people they might have come in contact with during the infectious period, which is essentially for COVID safe, 48 hours before they, a person develops symptoms. So we'll, when, for example, if Alice is sick today or Bob or person A, um, if I call them, I'll be like, who did you, do you remember who you came in contact with? What are the places you went to when you got sick and 48 hours before that? And based on that information collected from that person, um, the list of contacts is collected and collated, and then the contact tracing teams start to contact those contacts to notify them of an exposure and advise them on um, the need to quarantine, the rationale for quarantine, but also assess their individual risk. Now, we do this two ways, as you've mentioned, the backward and the forward. The, uh, the forward one is where essentially a person has been exposed to the, uh, has been confirmed to be infected, and we follow up all their contacts they might have come in contact with in the lot during their infectious period, as I mentioned. So that's what's happening with a lot with COVID safe at the moment. The backward approach is what we do often for diseases like foodborne diseases, where you might see a case of um, salmonella pop up in the community. And what in that case you'll do is do again a case investigation and try and identify where this particular person may have picked up the disease from. So for that, you might um, interrogate them for the places they've been and try to, or who they may have been exposed to, to identify that link with another person. And this technique is mostly useful and most critical for when we start seeing um, un unlinked cases. So we would have all heard about the unlinked cases for COVID-19, and luckily we don't have many in Australia. We've only had a small proportion till date in certain jurisdictions. And so we've done really well. And one of the key metrics is that if you're all your cases who are appearing are on your list of contacts, then that's a really good thing because that means your contact tracing is working effectively. And so um, one of the things that apps like COVID Safe or any technological solution, what they can do in this particular context is really enhance that way of how human contact tracers do that because we know diseases like COVID-19 are highly contagious. Um, and timeliness of contact tracing is really the key, how quickly we can identify those contacts and have that conversation with them, um, recommend and advise them to self-quarantine, the, the more chains of transmission we are minimizing because we have only about four to five days before that person who's been exposed um, reaches the other side of their incubation cycle where they might become infectious as well. So hopefully that answers. So, yeah, absolutely. And so, so one of the big differences between the two approaches I described, in fact, ultimately really the major difference that we can identify at the functional level as distinct from the sort of the technological distinctions um, and differences among them um, is the ability to link someone who's been exposed to risk, notified of their exposure to a, an actual positive test case. So that's something that in the Apple and Google APIs for their approach, they say you're explicitly not allowed to do. When, when I receive a notification that I'm exposed to risk, um, in that situation, um, there's no way of connecting me back to the person who tests positive. So can you tell me just, just very quickly how useful you think that ability to link the person notified of risk to the um, positive test, um, how important is that for, from the contact tracing perspective? Yeah, so when we do normal traditional contact tracing or when, as we do routinely for all other diseases, a person, an individual's identity is never linked, a, per, a case's identity is never linked to a contact unless the case specifies so. So for example, if you're a family unit or a husband, wife, you might know that your um, partner has contracted the disease. But as a general rule, we never reveal the identity of the person who's infected. So knowing where they may have been exposed is really critical because that helps you build what we call the clusters as you've been hearing. And so that again helps you understand um, how the disease transmission is happening, the epidemiology of the disease, events like the super spreading events, we can only understand those if we can link all these cases 
um, contacts to a particular case by what we call the time, place, person association, but not so much as an individual identity, but their demographic identity or where they may have been at what time. Those are key elements of information needed. Fantastic, thanks. So I'd like to, to come over to James now. Um, so one of the things that we all know, and it's lovely to see Vanessa there. So Vanessa has joined us now. Um, sorry about that. Um, so one of the things that we know about this approach is that it's new, right? So the, the, we've used technology in all sorts of ways in order to support contact tracing in the past, um, but we haven't done anything exactly like these, um, this Bluetooth-based approach. So could you tell us, James, just a little bit about the research that has been published, um, really that provides the evidence base for taking this approach to using Bluetooth to support contact tracing? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Seth. I'll do my best. So um, I guess some quick general background. Models of things like contact tracing interventions have been used for maybe a, since SARS, essentially. I mean, there, there was some earlier work, but there's been a, a series of pieces of work done over the time, sort of between about 2003 and the early 2010s, looking at how contact tracing might work for infections like influenza and what the sort of the, the important parameters are there. And, and I guess they, these kind of highlight two critical factors relating to the pathogen and some implementation factors, which are the pathogen, the time from exposure to becoming infectious, which for flu or COVID is short. Uh, the fraction of cases that can be detected. Uh, again, that's a problem for flu and COVID because there's a big symptom range. And so in many settings, few cases are being detected. Um, and then there's implementation factors which relate to the behavior of cases and contacts after isolation. The fraction of contacts can be traced and delay to isolation and quarantine. And I guess for SARS-CoV-2, it's a little as three days from exposure to infectiousness. So you don't have a lot of time, which is sort of the, the element that the app seeks to address. So what they're doing in the Ferretti paper, which I think you're sort of talking about, which appeared in Science, sort of in print in, in May, but I think a, a month or so beforehand uh, as, a, as a kind of a preprint, they're looking at the ability of the app to instantaneously notify contacts of cases and then what effect that instantaneous or some would ha instantaneous notification would have on our ability to preempt transmission. Okay, and in particular, this is important for COVID because of pre symptomatic or early symptomatic transmission. So perhaps a lot of the transmission events occur within three or four days, only perhaps starting three days after exposure. And so timing's really critical there. Um, and so they, they, they look at um, essentially three key parameters here. They look at the, the time delay from a case developing symptoms to being tested. Um, and they look at then the proportion of all cases and contacts that are either isolated or quarantined. And they kind of make this assumption that all symptomatic cases are actually tested. Okay, so whether whether your testing definition is a is a lab test or clinical sort of I've got COVID like symptoms, they're assuming that as soon as you decide you want to be so all symptomatic cases are tested, and they say they assume that all contacts change their behaviour as soon as an exposure notification happens. Um, so on that side of things, and they also don't really look at practical aspects. So they talk in a couple of lines in the discussion about the sort of things which affect this, such as for example the fraction of people who have the app on their phones. So really your proportion of contacts you can actually detect through this is proportional to the fraction squared it has to be on a person's phone who's the case as well as the contacts. Um, and then it depends on behavior afterwards. So there's a few implementation factors that they do not consider. And I guess this is kind of a, a sort of, you know, it's, it's advocating a particular line and trying to, trying to suggest that there might be potential for a paradigm shift in how we do this, but it's early evidence, okay? And it hasn't been assessed um, rigorously with other sort of competing models, I, I suppose. Um, so, so just to sort of paraphrase, the, the basic idea is that um, of the paper is essentially that it operates instead of manual contact tracing or um, that the, the way in which it proceeds um, is independent of manual contact tracing. That may be something that happens as well. Um, and the idea is just that you're notified as soon as somebody who you've been within, within a certain distance of you, your device has. Um, and at that point, you self-quarantine until you get a test. Um, so I guess one of the assumptions that they're making then is that um, it's people are going to take a notification from an app or from a person 
um, and they're going to use that as a reason to stay home until they're able to get a test. And something that you and I talked about the other day is um, sort of how long it makes sense, um, how long it would one would be required to stay home under those circumstances. So can you just say a little bit about, um, you know, how long, what sort of, what sort of cost you, this approach assumes people will be, will be prepared to take on in order to avoid the risk of further spreading the disease? So the, the, in the paper itself, they're somewhat agnostic about these details. I mean, they do, they do not essentially include these uh, system aspects in their model. Okay, so they talk about it in discussion. They suggest that this could be integrated with um, uh, public health and reporting to it, but they don't make any specific choices about that. In their, in their approach, they're suggesting people would be, uh, the high risk contacts would be isolated for 14 days. Okay, and the sense from another study, which has been a preprint, which has come out based on the UK pandemic experiment, where they um, had about 40,000 sort of people involved, um, is that you'd probably be isolating 30 to 100 people um, per case. Okay, so when you've got few cases, maybe that's not a big issue. Of course, that's 14 days of person time for each, so a lot of person time. But if you imagine uh, this being applied in sort of a, a large epidemic with 100,000 cases, well, that's going to affect a very large number of people. Um, of course, they may be more inclined to because they feel they're more at, at risk, but certainly there's, there's significant cost implications for the individuals involved. On the other hand, if you compare that to a shutdown where people are losing jobs and so on, the overall economic impact is probably rather lower, but it's more faced by specific individuals. Good, okay. So, so hopefully that gives you some sense of the sort of the two ends of the spectrum here. So on the one hand, um, there's an approach that would try to integrate um, the, the information you can get from apps into the existing contact tracing processes. And on the other hand, you've got an approach that sort of tries to automate as much as possible. And the rationale for the automation approach is largely down to the fact that um, COVID-19 is so, um, or SARS-CoV-2 is so quick to be um, transmitted and it does so before we're able to test people, before we're able to, um, uh, before people become symptomatic. So that was kind of the motivation, I think, at the start to set up this alternate approach. Um, now, so that's looking at this from the perspective of public health, like what can you use this information for? What are the valuable information flows? You know, when, who do we want to, like, why, how much does it matter that the health authority knows who has been exposed to risk? Um, how much does it matter that you as, a, as an individual know whether you've been exposed to risk? Um, but obviously that's only one side of the picture here. The other side um, is that all of those information flows carry potential risks with them. So it's, you know, it's a, the same as always true for any time you get a lot of data together, a lot of information together. Um, it can be used for good. It can also be used for ill. So I'd like to switch gears now and start to talk a bit about the um, potential privacy risks that come with um, an approach like this, um, either approach really. Um, and I'd like to shift over to talking um, to Catherine. Um, so Catherine, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself, there you go. Uh, okay, so um, at the moment, let's just think about COVID Safe, um, the app that we currently have. Um, now COVID Safe has a national data store. Um, basically every time someone tests positive who has the app, um, they can consent to have their contacts uploaded uh, it includes a log of all of their contacts. So every, every Bluetooth um, connection that they've made with another phone. Um, and that is held in the national data store, which can subsequently be accessed by health authorities. Um, so could you say a little bit about what the privacy risks are that are associated um, with that national data store of contacts? And just sort of imagine it, you know, suppose we have a second wave, think about it sort of six months out from now. Um, so, you know, at the moment, there's like five contacts. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 this must be the smallest, most protected data set in the world. Um, but imagine six months in, suppose we do have a significant second wave. Um, what would be the privacy risks associated with that national data store? Yeah, so imagining that we do have then a much bigger influx of uses of uh, the COVID Safe app data and, and then this increase in, in what's in the central data store. By the end of the pandemic, you would have a central database. It's got a list of all of those app users who've tested positive and along with that, lists of their contact logs, which would show you over a period of three weeks leading up to their positive test, who they'd been in contact with, who's an app user, the duration, the date, 
um, the distance approximately between the two of them. And this can be quite revealing if we start to think about it. It starts to answer for us, why do we care, for example, uh, if the app collects more data, much more data than is actually necessary? And why might we care if that data is kept for much longer than is required for contact tracing? Um, so firstly, we've got the issue of improper access. Um, you might have a government employee or anyone else who manages to get into that central data store um, who can reveal information about you from those contact logs to embarrass you or to endanger you. So in uh, real life, um, we've seen the example in another context of a Queensland police constable who hacked into the police system and got the address of a domestic abuse a victim and gave that address to her violent former partner. Um, on the embarrassment side, those contact logs would also show whether, for example, you'd been visiting a particular lawyer or a say, psychiatrist or HR from a rival firm or uh, a lover who others may not approve of. Uh, aside from that improper access, there's the possibility that down the track, the government changes the law about what that um, data can be used for, this mission creep issue. Um, and so there uh, it might mean that instead of just being used for contact tracing, you could use that data, the government could, to work out who may have long-term health effects from a COVID-19 infection or uh, who might have been at the scene of the crime or near a person who's suspected of committing a crime, who might have been in contact with a journalist at the time of a controversial investigation. Um, it could be used uh, if the government's making accusations of other unlawful conduct such as tax evasion or cartel conduct. Or you could have simply a robo-debt style situation where the government gives uh, a list of your contact logs to a journalist if you have been critical of the government. Um, so those are the kinds of issues that arise, the kind of risks that arise, the more data we have and the longer we store it. So yeah, I think one, one that's great. And one other thing that I would add, well, there's an echo now. Um, so one other thing I would add is that with, a, with these large data sets, um, it's often really hard to predict what they're going to be useful for as well. So like we can anticipate a, a wide range of uses, um, but then the bigger they get, the more the sort of unexpected connections might be, um, other kinds of predictions might be made. So that's the, um, the, the data store. Um, I want to sort of look at a couple of other information flows that might be risky. So just one small one, and I'd, I'd like to sort of bring Vanessa in on this as well in a moment. Um, so one small one is, um, so why do you think that it's a good idea to design a system so that someone who's um, notified of exposure to risk doesn't know who the person was who tested positive? Like what's the sort of the downside of being able to join those dots? Yeah, I, I think here we've already seen that people can be very vindictive and aggressive even just based on prejudice about who they think is causing infection in our community. Um, and let alone if we had a situation where they might actually know who is causing infection. So if that kind of information were available, you can imagine quite vengeful behaviour against the person who is identified as the contact, especially if they're already a member of a group who might be targeted on the basis of their race or their religion, or their um, sexual uh, orientation or um, gender, as we saw in Korea, for example. So, and then even more so, if um, that blame could be placed uh, for somebody else's death, if the infection actually led to death. So we certainly wouldn't want um, that kind of vindictiveness and, and vengeful behavior to be a possibility. Good. So there's good reason to, to be concerned about a national data store. There's good reason also to make sure that um, someone notified of risk never knows who they were exposed to. Um, so Vanessa, if I can um, bring the next question to you. So as well as there being obviously a um, national data store, um, under the COVID safe system, everybody's phone carries a list of their 
contacts for the last 21 days, everyone who, they, um, who, are, who they've encountered who has had the COVID Safe app on their phone. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the risks are associated um, with that um, and what might happen if somebody were to access your phone and were able to, um, to extract um, the contacts from it? Yes, so this is also a good question. I think that the questions that Catherine has been raising about the existence of the centralised data store are probably the most important questions and are sort of inherent to the centralised model. But another aspect of the centralised model is that even if you haven't tested positive, right, you're still keeping on your phone this log of um, all of the encrypted messages that you've received from everybody else who was running the app within Bluetooth range of you. And in the centralised model, those are IDs of other people encrypted with the authority, with a key that the authority knows. So, for example, if you were in a situation like the uh, Australian Federal Police raids on the ABC, in which the um, in which the person who was under who was being investigated was compelled to open their phone, then there's the potential that those logs could be read uh, in a way that is decryptable. Now, it's not supposed to happen, and maybe we can go back to Catherine to talk about what the laws preventing that kind of behaviour are, but the fact is that information is there stored on the phone. And at least the last time we looked, it was not stored encrypted in a way that was in addition to the encryption of the ping in the first place. Good, okay. So, so that's the risks associated with um, sort of someone accessing the data on your phone. But the other thing that your app does and that the basic nature of any Bluetooth contact tracing app or contact tracing supporting app is that it goes around sort of advertising its presence. Um, now, there have been a number of uh, vulnerabilities in the implementation of COVID Safe that have been drawn out. Um, some of these remain under embargo, so um, we need to be careful not to um, discuss anything that's confidential. Um, but at the same time, it'd be worth just sort of getting a general sense of what kind of risks there are associated. In this case, ultimately, it's um, you know, the risks that are associated with not working, not using a Bluetooth protocol that was explicitly designed for the purpose of supporting contact tracing. Mm -hmm. So, so far, we've been talking about privacy risks against a central authority. And the things we've been saying are really inherent to the centralised model and are not going to be easily fixed. But now we're switching over to a discussion of privacy against third parties. So third parties who don't have the government's decryption key, who can't decrypt the individual pings or our logs in our phone, but who can do things like put a Bluetooth beacon in a shopping centre, listen out for messages and try and identify whether the same person is coming by. People who can do things like read the logs on a person's phone and perhaps detect the phone make and model, which are not encrypted in transit. So these are third party risks and most of them could be mitigated, but at least at the moment in COVID safe, they're not well mitigated. So one example is that in any of these Bluetooth based protocols, the random looking pings that you send out are supposed to change frequently. And that's meant to stop it being easy to identify when you've been past the same place twice. And that's been a thing in Bluetooth long, long before contact tracing. Everybody who was using Bluetooth was supposed to change their, um, the random numbers that they were presenting to the rest of the world for exactly this reason. Unfortunately, although the Singaporean trace together basis uh, the open source code changes its random number every 15 minutes. The designers of COVID Safe decided instead to expand that to a two hour window. So, if, for example, you have a home surveillance device like a Google Mini or a whatever in your home, and also you go and visit somebody else, and also you go to the shopping center, then any commercial entity that has a Bluetooth listening capacity at all three of those places is going to be able to figure out that you were the same person all across those two hours. 
Now, in addition to that to our length, they've also introduced a whole lot of bugs that cause that random looking beacon to not switch over as quickly as it's supposed to. And in some cases, it doesn't seem to switch over for, for a whole day or even longer. So this introduces the strong possibility for third parties to be able to recognize you again when you come back. They can't immediately tell who you are, but if they can tell who you are in one of the places you've interacted with them, then they can link all your subsequent interactions with their Bluetooth beacons that they've set up. Good, okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I want to move um, on to the mitigation. So we've talked about, you know, what the public health benefits are potentially of apps like these and what the evidence base is for them. And we've talked about the privacy risks, both um, of the centralized data collection and of the phone and of the apps sort of sitting on the phone. Um, so next I'd like to talk about the mitigations for these risks. Um, so there's three different categories that I want to focus on. One of them is legal. Um, so we'll talk with Catherine about that. I want to talk also briefly about the operational um, mitigations. After all, contact tracing always involves dealing with very sensitive data. Um, so there are well-established practices for mitigating some of these risks. Uh, and it would be good also to talk about the technological mitigation as well, um, which will allow us to shift gears and discuss a bit more the Apple and Google exposure notification API. Um, so starting with you, Catherine. Um, so the legislation that was passed um, on the 14th, I think, um, was passed with support of both part of, of all major parties. Um, it was um, described as some of the strongest legislation to protect data in Australia that has ever been passed. Um, you and um, Graham Greenleaf at UNSW have written a detailed study of the legislation. I'm curious to know if you wouldn't mind just sort of summarizing its basic, its core elements and saying what you think may have been left out. Yes, and I should go back just for a moment to those um, comments that this is the most legally protected data in Australia and the best ever and so forth. Um, I think at the That's outset, low bar. <laughs> yeah, we shouldn't get too excited about this. Um, Australian privacy laws are well behind privacy laws in other jurisdictions, which is why the ACCC last year recommended major reforms to our privacy laws and why the Law Reform Commission has twice recommended that we should have a tort of serious invasion of privacy and no, neither of those recommendations have actually been taken up at this point. And it's as a, a setting for this also important to remember that in Australia we don't have a fundamental right to privacy. So you won't find that, that we can say if the law is changed down the track, um, take that, uh, that, go to court and challenge that law on a constitutional basis and say this degradation of our privacy was not uh, necessary and proportionate um, having regard to the other interests. So it, it, I think that context is necessary at the outset. As to the COVID Safe Act, which was passed a bit over 10 days ago now, there were some key protections built into the Act. Um, some of those include that there are some good provisions um, preventing people from forcing others to download or use the app. There are also um, a number of restrictions. Uh, actually, there's a general prohibition against using the COVID app data and then just some restricted permissions as to when it can actually be used and disclosed. Um, there are also provisions that allow people to request some of their data to be deleted. That's just the registration data and also some sunset provisions so that at the end of the pandemic at least, the contact logs themselves will be required to be deleted from that central data store. As to what's missing from that framework, um, as you said, Graham Greenleaf and I have written a much longer paper on this, and so the details are there, but I'll just name some of the big items. Um, the, for starters, the uh, law allows the system to collect and store much more data than is necessary for contact tracing, and it doesn't uh, prevent uh, the health officials from accessing that excess data. In addition to that, um, it allows the contact logs to be kept, as I said, to the end of the pandemic period, and that's much longer than that data is required 
for contact tracing. We should have automatic deletion a lot earlier than that. Um, in addition to that, we need to tighten up the loopholes that exist in the anti-coercion provisions, which we pointed out, and already we see some restaurants, for example, requiring people to disclose whether they've got the app on their, their phone and they're using it. And if they don't, requiring them to hand over more contact details and identification before they can get a seat. Um, and so those are some of the issues that we've raised and some of the reasons which I, can, I should go into a little more about why consent is critical here and voluntariness is critical. I think we need to cover that as well. Yep. Um, okay, so I think when we talk about the Google and Apple protocol, it would be a good point to do that because that will give us a chance to, to do a compare and contrast. Um, Meru, so with contact tracing as it currently is, it's important to sort of acknowledge, I think, that it, you know, it involves a form of surveillance and it involves a form of... Um, you know, it involves acquiring sort of very sensitive details about people. Can you tell us something a little about um, how in the conduct of contact tracing, those kinds of sensitivities tend to be handled, um, how the data that's gathered is protected, um, and how you ensure that it's not used for purposes beyond what it's intended to be used for? Yeah, that's an important question, Seth. And as I said, I think it's important to remember that contact tracing is not a new thing. We've done it for decades and decades and decades. It's one of the key most proven um, public health effort and outbreak response activity that's been done in a lot of diseases. And so when operationally talking, when a contact tracer does do contact tracing and any public health data that includes the data from contact tracing is managed under what's called the Public Health Act. Um, and each and every state and territory jurisdictions, different parts of the world might have their own act. They might have variations, but really, the large governing thing is a lot of it is around um, maintaining an individual's privacy um, and securing the data. The data is usually stored in a secure password protected data set and that's more public health perspective, but also anyone who's doing that is usually bound by confidentiality. So that would be key part of their responsibility and thing that they would do when they um, are part of the public health department doing any kind of contact tracing and that's not new. And usually you would only do, for example, contact tracing at a designated facility, you wouldn't use your personal phone. You wouldn't. You'd use your, um, you know, the Department of Health's phone, where um, the data can only be used for um, someone's contact log can only be used for that purposes of contact tracing. And of course, then the data is stored in a sensitive, password protected um, manner, which then later might be used for epidemiological analysis. And I think that's an important thing to remember that unless we know, if, for example, if thousand people were exposed to a person and only five got stick out of that, that's really important information. Unless we have your contact data linked to the major, the full picture of surveillance data, so to speak, or the epidemiological data, we're not gonna understand how the disease transmission is working. We're not gonna be able to prevent and design policies that, and interventions that will prevent the spread of the disease and the outbreak itself. So hopefully that briefly answers that question. Absolutely, and, and I think it brings us to the next point really nicely because um, you know, we, um, we've seen what has been passed as far as legislation goes, so we know where we're at with that. Um, we already know what the um, operational approach is, um, but we still have some choices to make as far as the technology goes. Um, so at the moment, the um, head of the DTA said that COVID Safe will be switched over to the new Apple and Google Exposure Notification API at some point. Um, now, um, it's worth sort of dwelling a little bit on this. Um, there's been a fair amount of detective work involved as to what this would mean. Um, because obviously the Apple and Google Exposure Notification API went live last week. Um, the documentation is there, and I should say that if you go to at HMI underscore ANU after this, we'll be sharing all of the, all of the resources that we've referred to. Um, so that there is documentation describing how the new Exposure Notification API within um, uh, that's being offered by Apple and Google will work. It's worth saying that this is a pretty unprecedented collaboration between those two companies. Um, the distinction between what they're going to offer and what um, is currently possible within COVID Safe has two basic parts. One is the technological and the other is the functional. The functional one is fairly easy to describe quite quickly as far as I can work out after having delved into this at laborious length uh, over many late nights over the last few weeks. Um, the functional difference really comes down to one thing. There's an explicit prohibition on linking the person who is notified of exposure to the person who tested positive. 
you can get almost all the same other data um, from the Apple and Google Exposure Notification API as you can from, the, um, from COVID Safe. But that bit in particular is prohibited. And there's the opportunity to include more stages of specific consent. Um, but the, on the technical side, it's very different. So Vanessa, that's where I turn to you. Um, can you please explain to us um, as, as quickly as you can, the distinction <laughs> between a decentralized and yes. centralized architecture for exposure notification? Yes. So this is a really fundamental cryptographic difference that induces uh, two completely different ways in which citizens relate to the central authority. So we have cryptography leads fundamental political differences. So in the centralized model, which is the way that the COVID safe app works, is exactly what we've been describing, right? It matches traditional contact tracing in a complete kind of a way in which when somebody tests positive, they upload to a central authority their complete list of everybody in Bluetooth range who's been running the app. And then the central authority decrypts all those IDs and contacts those people. The decentralized approach is completely different. We still start by sending around a random looking Bluetooth pings, but instead of being encryptions with a key that the central authority knows, they're just pseudo randomly generated numbers that nobody can identify. And the, the key difference is that now the computation of whether or not I've been exposed to somebody who tested positive is something that happens on my phone based on information that a person who tested positive shares on a public, effectively a public notice board. So now I'm checking on my phone whether or not I've been exposed to somebody who tested positive to the virus and I'm getting a notification, but then there's no inherent inform, information flow that goes through that central authority and no central database that holds on to that contact graph. Excellent. So, um, now that we're considering making this move, yes. that would mean there's no central database. It would right. mean that there's no way for a central authority if they have grab your phone um, to extract data from the, from the app itself. Now those mm -hmm. are two of the main privacy risks that we were talking about before yeah. um, and um, that were intended to be protected by the legislation. So one question for you, Catherine, um, is do you think that, so the first question is, if we do make the shift over to the Apple and Google exposure notification API, what proportion of the recently passed legislation will still have any application at all? Uh, a great deal of that legislation does apply to um, the, the central data store and what can be done with the data that's uploaded to that central data store. Um, and so, yeah, there, there would be a great deal of it that, that would no longer apply. Some of the things that would apply, though, are the, and, and these wouldn't directly apply, I just mean that they could be recycled in legislation about this approach, is the coercion provisions. Um, and I think they would be very important on that matter of consent. The reason that this is meant to be a voluntary scheme is in part because it is an experiment and we do need to acknowledge that not everybody can be part of this experiment. There are many groups that don't have access to their own smartphone or to the network coverage necessary to support the kind of tracing that we're talking about and we shouldn't be making this ever compulsory in either of those kinds of apps. Um, so we have Dr. Norman Swan, Swan, who I greatly respect as a medical doctor, saying that um, we should now not allow people on public transport if they don't have the app. That would mean, of course, that if people can't afford a smartphone, that they wouldn't be able to uh, use buses and trains. So you, and what then? Are they going to park their BMW at Moore Park? You've got to recognise that we can't be using this to exclude vulnerable sections of the population. So I think those anti-coercion provisions would still be really important. Excellent. And on the decentralised model, um, so one of the things that we, we had a sort of a late night discussion about last night, um, was exactly how they're going to, like the role of specific consent. Um, so it's worth just sort of drawing that out. So with COVID safe at the moment, you consent to download the app. Um, you put in your information to it. Um, you do have to put in some information. 
Um, and then you consent if you get tested positive to upload um, your contacts. And that's the end. That, those are the, the, the only roles that consent plays. Within the new uh, framework API from App and Google, um, they're very explicit about saying that one cannot require any personally identifying information in order for somebody to receive exposure notifications. So that's one extra layer of consent. You can choose whether or not to put in your user information. Um, although it is emerging, and this is something that we have yet to fully confirm, but we, we think it's the case, um, that the way the app is going to work is going to allow health authorities to design it um, so that um, they are automatically notified that this user of the app has been exposed to risk when that person receives a notification of exposure. Um, another way to do it would be to have the app only notify the individual, uh, not notify the public health authority, um, and then allow them to sort of choose to contact the contact tracers. Um, so that's something that I think is sort of <laughs> relatively breaking news. It comes from sort of looking in, in detail at the different APIs and um, we'll sort of see how they flesh out. But so it seems pretty clear that as far as security goes, as far as some of those privacy risks go, um, it's a lot more secure to have a decentralized architecture. What we haven't talked a lot about the particular functionality problems of um, the current app working in the background on iPhone. Some of those functionality problems were resolved by some early updates. Those updates introduce new problems. Basically, um, the phone leads to the, the app leads to people's Bluetooth devices disconnecting more frequently. Um, there's also a permanent sort of long-term tracking issue that is essentially caused by this functionality problem with respect to the use of Bluetooth. So from the perspective of privacy, functionality as an app um, and security, there's obviously a strong incentive to shift to the Apple and Google um, framework API. Um, but I'd like to come back to the public health functionality of this alternative. Um, so one thing, I've got two questions here, one for James and one for Meru. Um, so for James, the question is, um, you know, when you base major public policy making on statistical modeling, um, what's the optimal scenario for using statistical models as evidence for big public policy decisions? You and I have talked in the past about how some models sort of evolve with data over time. Can you say a little bit about that here? Yeah, it's, it's a very challenging sort of question. I suppose um, we're in a situation where, you know, we often talk about all models being wrong and some being useful. In this case, all data is biased and some is useless. Um, so we, we have difficulty making decisions based on the data that's been collected for, it's getting better, but available for SARS-CoV-2. And we've had to use models to inform policy making because we haven't had anything else. What I would say is the the, the ecosystem of models used for things like um, staying at home or schools closure and so on and even traditional contact tracing um, they've been developed over maybe a 15 to 20 year period I suppose and compared with data from other sorts of infectious diseases doesn't make them right and obviously we haven't had prior experience of this virus but it does mean we have some sense of how they performed previously and some of the deficiencies in the in the assumptions have been tested through prior use what I would say with the apps is that we really don't know a number of basic features about these. So the, the Ferretti model, I think, is very useful in terms of saying what the sort of maximal benefit of this might be in a, in a challenging situation, assuming a number of things are fairly optimal. What it doesn't tell us is what the practical impact will be when all the implementation features, such as, for example, the fact that Bluetooth measurement may or may not be useful, um, that... The, the, the uptake may or may not be good, but the way in which people behave may or may not be what we expect. Um, all of those features are unknown at the moment. We may have a, I think we could make decent guesses about them that in, in follow-up work that haven't been done in that paper, but ideally, right, we, we should be assessing these, right? So we should be running, ideally, experiments on different approaches um, to try to test these out in parallel I, I, while we're working. That's what we're trying to do with everything else. So why not for this? So that's, that's a great point. And I think, so one thing that you mentioned, and it's, I mean, I'm sure everybody watching this already knows this, but it's worth just reminding everybody that um, Bluetooth signal att attenuation is a very weak proxy for proximity. Um, it depends on how you're holding the phone at the time. It can only measure when it's being scanned. So you could be next to somebody when they're measuring it, go away and then come back and you'd be next to them again. 
Um, it's, it's a fairly weak piece of evidence for the things that matter. Um, so Mario, I'd like to, um, before I just sort of wrap things up, try and wrap things up within the hour and then go on to Q&A, um, I'd like to just sort of um, really get a sense of the value of the information that we're not going to be able to have from the Apple and Google API. So let's just be clear, James's last point there was that we don't really know which of these methods is going to work. Um, it would be good to be able to try different things out and test them and see. Um, and what's fairly clear from the way the Apple and Google Framework API is right now is that they've placed privacy really at the very center of it. Um, and they are explicitly at present uh, prohibiting the association of the person who um, is notified of exposure with the person who tests positive. Um, one thing we might want to do instead is you might want to run both approaches in different countries where the conditions suit and where the local sort of values um, kind of fit those two, those different trade-offs and see which one works. Um, but in the absence of the ability to do that, it'd be useful to sort of draw on your experience, Meru, um, in, in the work of contact tracing, just to see how, how useful you think this information will be if we don't have that link between the person notified of exposure and the person who was tested positive. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, I guess one of the most important points that I want to make is that contact tracing is only as good as how engaged the community is. So if an individual doesn't feel empowered, um, it's not going to work because really we're relying on them quarantining themselves because they've been exposed. And that's probably one of the most important things is to have that community engagement. And one of the other things that contact tracers, the human contact tracers do, is this whole element of personalised interviewing process. So when a health authority calls you, you go through a conversation, the rationale. Now, an automated ping through an app may work for some people to quarantine, but a vast majority of people may not understand, despite all the media talk and when things go back to normal, that why they should quarantine. And assessing personal risk, so if you're a sole parent, with, you know, what do you do? How do you quarantine? Who do you get that information? So a lot of the time, it's also about providing that reassurance, assessing individual risk of that um, person to enable them to have take on the quarantining, the two-week period that they need to um, spend at home. Or if somebody lives in a big house, um, house with lots of people, but sh lots of shared facilities. So those are important things that contact tracing involves. And so really, it's about providing. And then sometimes you might have to provide some psychosocial support. Some people may freak out because you know, they may not understand what it means to be a contact of the case. And so those are critical elements that are part of the public health response. And I think any solution, any technological solution really needs to encompass both of those that the community needs to be engaged, the individual needs to be empowered, and that information is useful. There's no point collecting data by whatever tools you are if it's not useful for understanding, for breaking chains of transmission and understanding the epidemiology of the disease. So if we can't say, the five people who've been infected were five out of five versus five out of thousand, then that really data doesn't help understand the future of the disease. And then to be able to plan for when we have an increase or resurgence in cases, we really need to be able to understand what the drivers of transmission might be, which um, knowing the number of people exposed is really becomes really important. So the data has to really be useful, A, for engaging the community, but B, also for the public health response. And I think from a field epi and a public health perspective, I think those would be the main things, um, and technology can only enhance the human side of things, I think. That would be. That's really well put. Okay, so I think we're going to, we'll end the, um, the, the one hour of the, um, of the webinar here. Um, I don't think there's any need, I think that, that summed up well, I think we've got a, a really good overview. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna pull up the Q&A, um, which is probably gonna involve me doing this sort of gormless face as I look into the, um, try and read it um, for a minute. Um, and I'll sort of start trying to address, address questions. Um, people who have done Q and have, have done the questions with their name, um, I will um, I will mention the name. But otherwise, if you've done anonymous, then not. Okay. So by the way, I did try. I did intend for this to be a um, a gallery view. Um, I, I've noticed when you don't do it gallery view, it's just unreliable whether it um, goes to the right one. Okay. Okay, so I guess one, one big question um, that would apply, um, Catherine, uh, that would be a good question for you to field. Um, so can you tell us how secure the national data store is against being used, for the, used by, in particular, the intelligence community? Like what kinds of protections 
are put in place to prevent access um, from the intelligence community um, to that data? This question comes from Mark A. Lane. Uh, yeah, at present, um, the approach taken under the Act is that you have, as I mentioned earlier, that general prohibition that this app data can't be used at all. It can't be um, used or, or, or disclosed um, or collected at all. And then there are exceptions to that for the specific uses such as contact tracing or working out whether somebody has breached a provision of the Act um, or just some very limited um, de uh, reporting of de-identified data of the total number of registrations. Um, and the Act also states that it overrides any existing laws. And so it, it would only be the case that if a law uh, is subsequently passed that specifically refers to this new part of the Privacy Act and states that it, it overrides this part of the Privacy Act, that it could then um, apply and say give powers to the intelligence community or to anyone within government to access the app data for another purpose. Um, that's possible, of course, as I mentioned earlier, it, it, it is possible to have that mission creep and to have decisions made later about um, uses that the government would like to, to make of the app data. Um, but at the moment, the a clear intention is that this uh, is uh, part of the Privacy Act and the protections um, that it enshrines would override any other laws that would give um, the intelligence community or any other law enforcement access to the data. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, so there's another question here that I, that I love, um, which I want to address to Vanessa. Um, so, so those of us who have been following this closely, when Randall Brugge, uh, Brugge, um said that the uh, COVID safe would be shifted over to the, um, to the new Apple Google framework, I think there was a collective uh, dropping of jaws um, among those who've been following this. Um, so Vanessa, one question here is, um, so would changing COVID safe to the new framework change what devices or versions could run the app? Could both versions of the protocol be used? I'd like you to use that as a sort of a, a, a prompt to talk about some of the, if you like, the transition costs associated with the uh, apparently intended move over to the new framework. Yeah, wow. So first of all, let me say, I strongly suspect that he just didn't think that through, right? That actually that wasn't a clearly thought out, expressed intention to make a major and fundamental change to the app. I'm guessing, right? Because I don't actually know any more about what he was thinking than anybody else. My guess, just based on the off-the-cuff way that he said it, was that he didn't have any understanding of what a profound and complete reorganisation of the system that represented. <laughs> but if we were to assume that he did know what he meant and we were to try to think about how that might work, um, so Josh, Josh Taylor from The Guardian asked me about this and I said, well, uh, I think it'd probably be a bit of a mess and it'd take at least a few weeks of running both things in parallel. Looking through the fine print of the APIs with Seth yesterday evening, we saw that one of the things that the Google Apple APIs will prevent is simultaneous use of ordinary Bluetooth by the same app. So in fact, it's not going to be possible to run both versions under the hood for three or four weeks or whatever as a transition. There's, uh, there's going to be some much more complicated transition involving, you know, effectively, everybody doing one thing and everybody beginning to do the new thing for a while and eventually removing the old thing. They, they do not interoperate in any, in any way at all. They're really just two completely inconsistent systems. Yep, so pretty big transaction costs. Um, so James, just one thing. Um, okay, so I think the, we covered the, uh, the sort of the s square of the fraction. Um, Someone's asked whether all panel members are using the app. Um, it's a good example of um, the sort of uh, the reason why there's the anti-coercion uh, measures within the law. So I won't ask anybody that. Um, okay, so so here's an interesting um, here's an interesting point. So this is a question that's been raised by William Blair, um, which I'd love to talk to. So William says that um, the uh, the Apple, Apple Google framework can't link back to the infected person. 
but the infected person passes up his or her series of IDs to some central database that other participants can download. Surely that provides a link. Yes, so this is a very interesting point. So Vanessa, maybe you and me can talk about this one because um, we've been trying to figure this out, right? So this comes back to that question of whether you can design the app in such a way that when a person is notified of their being exposed to risk, the health authority is notified that that person has been exposed. Um, in discussions with people uh, from Apple and Google, it seems that, that this is certainly the intention, um, that it can be done without, explicit, without specific consent. Um, if you have provided your user ID, then when the app notifies you that you've been exposed to risk, the health authority is able to access that information. It's very vague, it's ambiguous in the API. One of the interesting challenges that then raises is the possibility of what's called a timing attack. Um, essentially, once the person is authorized to upload um, their, um, so the person who's tested positive is authorized to upload their, their keys to the central database. Um, if at that moment, um, all the, all the, everyone's app was checking the device kind of live, um, and if you sort of, you put up that person's test, that, that person test, and then you waited for an hour, um, and then everybody who was notified of exposure, that automatically notified the health authority, then they would obviously be able to link the person who has been um, tested positive with the person who has been notified of risk, even though the app itself doesn't generate, it doesn't make that information explicit. Um, so that is, um, is explicitly prohibited within the APIs, both in the Android and Google. It says explicitly, you're not allowed to use this data to link two people. Um, but at the moment, um, because of this ambiguity as to whether they're going to allow um, health authorities to know whether the um, person's been notified without specific consent. Um, it's not clear that this isn't a vulnerability, although we do know that the plan, as far as I, can, I, I know, I think the plan is that the apps should sort of pull the central server once a day rather than kind of live throughout the day. So if you have loads and loads of cases, um, then it would, you wouldn't be able to, so if like if 300 cases have gone up on Tuesday, and then all of their contacts um, are notified on the same day, then you wouldn't be able to link them in a very efficient way. Um, but in the sort of situation like where Australia is with the, with the virus, where you might have one new case um, or in a particular area, um, if the um, health authority does know um, that someone's been notified of risk, then they will be able to make that link. Um, Vanessa, what, what light can you shed on this? Um, Yes, so there's a couple of slightly different questions here. I'm just reading the fine print of William Blair's question. One question is, does the individual find out who uh, exposed them? And then the second question is, does that information get conveyed to the central health authorities? Either that this new person has been notified of exposure or that they were exposed by a particular other person. Okay, so William Blair has asked, you know, surely this basic idea of publishing the list of um, pings from an infected person and then downloading them onto your phone and checking when you were um, checking whether or not you saw one of them inherently provides that link. And the answer is yes. In the vanilla version of how this decentralized protocol would work, you would automatically get the link between you and the ID of the person who had exposed you because you're doing that test on your own phone. Now, the Google Apple API puts a great amount of effort into obscuring that information and not, not making it available. And that's a deliberate privacy choice. That's not an inherent difficulty with the um, structure of the information flow. In fact, it would happen automatically if you didn't do something careful to stop the uh, person being able to immediately, the, the app from being immediately able to make that link. So they've specifically decided not to say, oh, actually on Monday afternoon at 3.30, you were exposed by ID number 57, which has subsequently tested positive. They easily could, they've chosen not to. Yeah, good. And um so that's the, the, where we're getting a lot of this information from, by the way, is um, so we'll share these documents on the HMI Twitter feed. Um, so Apple basically has a, um, well, Apple and Google, they both, they both have more or less the same. There's some interesting differences if you sort of dig into them, um, but they have uh, framework APIs, uh, application programming interfaces, which describe what um, the sort of the, the terms, the concepts, the, the, the architecture will be of these apps um, and what information therefore they can provide. 
Um, so the, the interesting bits come in what's called N exposure info, uh, which tells you what, it, what information about the exposure the app can reveal, can access. Um, and as Vanessa was saying, it's only the day. It's um, incre increments of time between five minutes and 30 minutes. Um, it won't tell you longer than 30 minutes, but it will tell you as low as five minutes. So that's an interesting, um, one of the sort of touch points with, um, with COVID safe has been that it shares all contacts, not just those of 15 minutes on one and a half, uh, one and a half meters. Um, so it will share five minutes up to 30 minutes, um, but it won't share the person you were exposed to and it won't share the precise time. Um, and as Vanessa was saying, absolutely could, right? So the interesting thing here is um, on the one hand, there's a, this sort of this technological choice about kind of how to design the system in order to minimize risk. But on the other hand, there's also a big public health, public health privacy choice about you know, what information you want to go where. Um, and fundamentally, I think one of the things that people should realize is that you can replicate all of the functionality of either system, well, of the centralized system in the decentralized system. You can't do the same the other way. Um, but um, that, uh, so the question about what functionality you want um, isn't one that is predetermined by whether or not you join the Apple or Google framework, except for the fact that Apple and Google have decided that it is, right? So um, it's not a technical obstacle. Okay, let me, um, so a lot of people have been talking about, and so Mary, this will be a question for you. Um, so a lot of people have been um, uh, questioning the messaging that's been coming out of government about COVID safe. There's no doubt that it has been presented in some fairly, um, I guess, confusing ways for people who might not be especially tech savvy as to what it achieves. In particular, um, there was a sort of now, I think, notorious comparison between COVID safe and sunscreen um, and slip, slap, slop and all that. Um, so it'd be um, useful to talk to say, Meru, um, you know, what, what do you think about the sort of the perhaps confusing messaging around the, protect, the kind of protection that COVID safe can give? Um, it's worth just sort of reinforcing um, you know, your, your view on the, on the sort of protection that using COVID safe provides us as a society, um, as distinct from the protection it provides us as individuals from using the app specifically. Thanks, Seth. Um, I won't endorse or disendorse the messaging around that. I think the important thing is that risk communication is an important thing and you can probably engage a lot of risk communication experts on talking about what's the right language. But I think one of the things um, to understand with this particular app, as we discussed earlier on, is that timeliness of the ability to get contact information at speed and be able to notify them with speed. And so and again, in public health and contact tracing, it's often not about an individual, it's about a population. So we're, we're trying to achieve population level impact really quickly. And I think the idea of an app, and I've said this before, I don't think it can replace um, the manual contact tracing or the human-based contact tracing that we already do for whether it's COVID-19 or for other diseases. It can probably be used to enhance and in improve our efficiency, uh, reduce the workload on contact tracers, et cetera. But I think what it really does is that if we were to go back to normal life, and um, I'm sure James can comment more on that fact that we think that an average in normal life, a person would come in contact with 10 people. Now, if you look at that over five days, that's 50 people. If you live in a busy city um, and commute for an hour, it provides that ability to rapidly notify or collect that information on contacts. Now, traditionally what you would do is Say, for example, measles, which we know is a more infectious disease than COVID-19 is, but what we have for measles is vaccine. So we don't realize the impact measles without vaccine could have and how extremely act, um, fast contact tracing you would have to do. And we do that anyway. Like every time there is an imported case of measles in Australia, public health units work incredibly hard to contact trace every single person they may have come in contact with. And often you'll see public notices and media statements saying a person who's been infected with measles passed through this, this, this area, they may have visited this shopping center or this particular nightclub because it's all about notifying and then you rely on people contacting you. So it's all about, I guess, the timeliness. And um, so that's probably the idea behind it. Um, I think the messaging needs to be more clear and that needs to be articulated to people what are the benefits? And then it has to be an optional thing. I think voluntary consent processes, or at the end of the day, it's about an individual choice whether they want the app or not. But I think it contributes or may be able to contribute towards um, making our contact tracing more efficient. But until we evaluate it, we're not going to know. And I think that's a challenge with a new disease and a new pandemic is that a lot of things are 
in emergency response, we often are going with the flow or on the fly because we don't know. We, it's, yeah, it's the best evidence you have to find the best solution. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's important. You know, I think some of the criticism of the slip, slap, slot messaging was a, was a little bit um, sort of overly literal. Um, you know, because the idea is like, if everybody has the, has the app and if it is able to assist with contact tracing, then it might mean that somebody who um, will emerge as being, um, as having, a, having tested positive um, will stay home, who wouldn't otherwise stay home. So that might mean that it breaks the chain of transmission. So it can play a protective role. Now, Catherine, I've seen your, if you know, but I've got, a, I've got a question that I'd like to address to you and you can maybe merge your, what you want to say now with, with, this, with this other question. So one of the things that we haven't talked about, and this is coming from a question from Jeffrey Huntley, uh, one of the things we haven't talked about is, um, you know, we've looked very narrowly at the COVID safe and the, um, the Apple Google kind of framework for how to sort of use apps to support contact tracing. Um, there's obviously a wide range of other alternative measures that could be used. You could be using GPS rather than only Bluetooth. You could also be using Bluetooth to monitor people's social um, distancing, right? So one of the things that they wanted to do with the NHSX app um, was to be able to give people a nudge as to whether they were doing a good job of staying one and a half meters away from people. Um, so I wonder if you could, as well as addressing the previous question, sort of talk a little bit about, um, you know, what you think, whether you think that there needs to be specific protections against you, against um, using the app to kind of monitor behavior um, as distinct from purely for the purposes of contact tracing. Yes, um, just to start with the, the previous point first, uh, I, I do take a different view um, to you um, to some extent, because I think when you stand back and, and think, what did, what did uh, the Prime Minister really mean when he was um, giving the sunscreen message? Yes, you could see it from a community perspective and, and understand that literally this is not going to protect you from a virus. And yet, I think that sense of uh, comfort that seeps through with that messaging, and as you'll see on some of the sites that advocate people downloading the app, that there are messages that once we reach 40%, um, you know, until we reach 40%, we won't be able to put an end to um, these job losses and um, the, the economic crisis and so forth. And, and quite clearly, even once we do reach 40%, that won't all stop. And so I think it's that general sense of being able to relax if you've done these things um, that is, is still troublesome and that we should avoid that kind of messaging. As to using the app data for other things such as working out whether somebody is staying in quarantine or whether they're getting close enough, too close to other people, that would certainly be ruled out at the moment because it's not one of the permitted uses that's an exception to the general prohibition um, and would clearly be much more intrusive than what's permitted at the moment. And I think in that respect, um, the government must realise that there is a big trust issue here. It has a trust problem. And it, last time the Federal Privacy Commissioner conducted a, a national survey about people's levels of trust in organisations um, managing their personal data back in 2017. And they asked about different kinds of organisations. And when it came to government departments, only 58% of Australians said that they thought that government departments were trustworthy in dealing with their personal data. Um, and so that is going to have a big effect on the extent to which people both use the technology and um, don't try and evade anything that's forced upon them, um, which may need, mean that the government needs to shift course somewhat to gain that trust by having a more decentralized model or restraining extra uses of data. Thanks for that. So I'd like to address the next question. This is sort of inspired by a question from Matuza Kassizade um, to James. So, so one, one of the things that people have been, you know, one of, one of the, the uh, first responses of a lot of people who have been commenting on these different apps has been to sort of cry uh, solutionism, right? We've got, um, there's, a, there's a problem, um, and there's an app for that, right? 
Um, so I'm curious to know from your perspective, um, do you think that investment in and sort of the, um, the efforts around COVID safe have come at the expense of other aspects of our public health response? I know that you're, um, you're, you're closely involved in some aspects of that. Um, from your perspective, do you think that um, it's been a process that, yeah, that has been sort of suitably complementary to a kind of whole spectrum public health response? Or do you think that um, it's been uh, used as a way of avoiding doing other things? And I'd like to address this also to Meru in a moment. So, Seth, I, I don't really think so. I think the public discourse would suggest that COVID safe is very important and, you know, it might replace other functionality. But as people sort of note, with 40% coverage, you may be catching 16% of contacts and then what happens? That's nowhere near enough to sort of bring an R0 of 2 down to 1, which is the sort of level of effect you need. So, I think that's well known in the people advising. And I, I, my, my view is that the state health departments are simply seeing this as potentially something that adds an extra layer that may catch a few more contacts, particularly in situations where it's difficult to trace them, such as public transport, malls, and so on. I really don't think that there's a sense that, um, that this will replace any of our, their activities, in part because the way in which contact tracing done it, 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 you try to be exhaustive with this. You really want to capture every case because if you miss them, um, you may find this bubbles up somewhere else. So it's really a bit of a different sort of mindset. So I, I, I sort of see it as something that's potentially an added extra. It, it, it will probably help, help a bit. Um, I, I worry a little bit about the implementation of the decentralized model if the way in which you think through support for that is not done well and that it might actually impede some of the public health activities potentially. Um, but at present, I just see it as a small additional benefit, a bit like closing schools. Yeah. Um, so, Meru, um, in, in, in your answer, would you mind just saying a little bit about how you think we're doing with respect to contact tracing at the moment? Like, what's our... Um, what is our level of capacity um, uh, well proportioned to the task? Look, I think so that's an important question and I might be biased because I do have a lot of friends and colleagues who are currently contact tracers. So I think, and, but I think the numbers in Australia speak themselves. If we hadn't done good contact tracing, each one of those cases would have gone and given us more and more cases and propagated new infections. So I think our numbers where we are now speaks for itself that contact tracing has done well. Um, I think our initial numbers, and I think looking at the original data as well, there was about eight to ten percent that remained unlinked cases at the start. Uh, when before, and that that was purely more, I think, before we introduced the compulsory quarantine for incoming travellers, because most of our cases, luckily, were from incoming infections, so it was easy to contain and suppress um, the outbreak relatively easier. Um, the public health authorities have worked out, but if they hadn't done the contact tracing, I think that could have really um, led to several seeding events as we've seen in other parts of the world. And I 100% agree with James that I think talking to colleagues, friends, me, who is a field epidemiologist and often would do this, this would only be seen as an additional benefit that might help that timeliness aspect and be able to identify those extra contacts. And um, you, we, people might be surprised that actually contact tracers work incredibly hard to identify each and every contact and be able to make that contact just because you also have somebody's phone number doesn't mean that you'll be able to reach that person. A lot of parts of the world, people can't do phone contact tracing, so parts of Africa, Asia, Pacific, you'd go and do person to person um, in face physical contact tracing and that sometimes includes going into remote villages. And so in, and Ebola is a classic example where we see very high mortality and you want to be able to identify each and every contact of the person and be able to backward trace as well. And people, any unlinked case, epidemiologists, contact tracers, work incredibly hard to identify those links and be able to then link those clusters, we say, and ring fence essentially around and every, each and every case because it's all about then stopping and propagating minimizing the propagation of the outbreak so I think and I think the fear would from the decentralized model for me personally would be that ability to make that human to human contact with an individual be able to assess their personal risk and provide that reassurance that you're okay just because you've been exposed doesn't a mean that 100% you're going to become uh, infected and what to do when you are if you do develop symptoms where do you go for testing rather than a person being manically trying to look for that information when they receive an automated 
um, text message saying, you need to quarantine, this is, um, you've been exposed. The initiation is coming from a trained health person who has the ability to give that reassurance, that messaging, what to do, how to manage your risks, what happens. And those are important elements um, of the whole public health response aspect. It's not just about a number and a contact. It's about- Yeah, so I do believe that the implementation of, the, of these apps will, um, I think it's very likely that it will enable health authorities to initiate contact and they'll find a workaround for the timing attacks. Um, I think, and I think that that certainly has been my impression of the debate as a whole, that, um, you know, there has been a very broad recognition that this is in no way a replacement for human contact tracing. Um, I think that that recognition is very different in a country like Australia, with a sort of at present touch with manageable caseload and very strong public health infrastructure um, than it is in the UK, where um, they've got sort of, you know, amateur contact tracers, like the sort of the contact tracing capacity isn't set up yet. And where, and in countries like the US, where public health infrastructure is um, re relatively feeble. Now, I think I should probably let you go in a moment, but there's one. A I do want to get through a couple more questions, um, and there's a really, really salient one here uh, from Alwyn Chu at the um, ANU, who's done some wonderful research on the COVID Safe app. Um, so Alwyn asks, um, are there any regulations governing the use of data collected by third-party Bluetooth monitors? Um, in relation to contact tracing, so that they may pick up from, uh, for, for example, the COVID Safe app. So in the ACT, there are close to 100 Bluetooth traffic monitors that collect MAC addresses of Bluetooth devices for traffic studies and management um, that could potentially be used to track movements of a contact tracing app user. Uh, we know as well that supermarkets, for example, have a bunch of Bluetooth beacons sat around them in order to detect um, where you are, what, what you're standing in front of. There's some really interesting research about the prospects for doing really, really micro location targeted ads. Like you're in front of the cereal aisle, you're in front of the cereal looking at it and you're like, you're looking at the, you know, the white new Cocoa Pops or the old Cocoa Pops. And it says, you know, get 50% off the white Cocoa Pops while you're standing there. So the, the use of, the, of Bluetooth for Antec has been around for a while. COVID safe and all other such apps are going to be going around basically saying, hi, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, uh, to everything around them. Um, Catherine, what do we know about the regulation that exists to um, prevent basically ad tech companies from harvesting Bluetooth data um, that they may be able to make it like well, infinitely more valuable by effectively cracking COVID safe? Um, this is highly topical because the ACCC is currently undertaking its ad tech inquiry, um, which may tangentially look into uh, the privacy aspects and, and particularly the, the privacy protections for consumers um, and, and look into those aspects as a function of competition within those markets as well. Um, the, the short answer is that um, at the moment, a, a lot of these firms are claiming that uh, tracking people in, in that way um, and tracking people in a number of other ways um, when they're operating online or, or using a digital device is not actually subject to our privacy laws because they say this is not personal information in the sense that it's not attached to your name or your mobile number or your email address and therefore we're just dealing with non-personal data and that is not covered by our Privacy Act. Um, I think that is uh, in many, many cases and including in the ad tech's uh, context, highly disingenuous. Um, and I think the firms involved know that they are um, attempting to identify, as they put it, the person behind the device and to create this 360 degree view of the person behind the device. And that there are a number of ways of doing that through identifiers that may not call me Catherine Kemp, but know that I am the individual that uses this phone and this laptop and that comes back to this house every day and so forth. And so at the moment, I think that is a, a real gap in the enforcement of our privacy laws. 
or if not that, then our privacy laws need amending because it is um, something that firms are increasingly doing uh, to try and, and track individuals, even when we try and avoid all of that kind of tracking. This is, this is a wonderful, uh, wonderful occasion when I can refer to the de re de dicto distinction in, in philosophy, which is precisely, precisely focuses on that question of, um, you know, you know the person who, who is, who does all the things that Catherine Kemp does, even if you don't know the name. Um, it would be remiss not to mention at this point that um, every time, and this, for, I mean, we now, have, we, had, we had got up to 200, 270 odd participants, we're now down to the hardcore of 130 odd left. I imagine that everybody who remains on this webinar um, has read Vanessa's work um, in connection to um, de-identification. Um, and it's just really, really important that, um, you know, this is, this is one of the ways in which the, uh, you know, the legislation that um, we operate under and the privacy principles that we operate under works on the assumption of uh, the sort of the possibility of usefully anonymizing um, data in a way that actually protects people. Um, and what Vanessa has shown in many cases, drawing um, sort of a, in, a, in a local application of research that was um, also done in the US on things like the Netflix movie data set, um, is that with just a couple of points of contact, um, two or three in most cases, you're able to re-identify people. Vanessa, would you like to, um, to, to, to bang the drum for people? Yes, I think you said that's a great introduction. You can only say de-identified like this. Really. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, that's exactly right. And that is the short summary. You can only say do identified in scare quotes because if you have any kind of detailed information about anybody, whether it's their medical record, whether it's their list of contacts over two weeks, whether it's a few physical positions that you found them, then it's overwhelmingly likely that you're going to be able to figure out who it was. So I haven't read the new protective legislation over the COVID safe app data, Catherine, but maybe you can um, tell me. My understanding was there's um, a quite poorly defined kind of open option to use it for, use de-identified <laughs> uh -huh, data for research. And it seems to me overwhelmingly likely that the list of people's contacts, particularly if it comes with timing information and how many people you were close to at any point um, in time and how long you were close to them and so forth, is highly likely to be identifiable, even if it has the name stripped off. So I'm concerned that that is one of the loopholes in the protections of this data. Um, I, I, can, I can answer that question. Yes, please. That was earlier on, that was one of the issues, um, that there was a more open-ended reference to uh, de-identified data falling outside of the definition of COVID app data. Not so in the final legislation. In the final legislation, there was quite um, a restricted permitted purpose uh, of de-identified data um, for the purposes of creating the total number of registration um, registrations and reporting on that and that um, that was the only type of de-identified data that was excluded from the definition of COVID app data. They need to go one step further and recognise in the deletion section that the exemption that they give to de-identified data is also restricted to that um, narrow purpose, which they haven't done yet, but at least that's a lot of progress from the initial position which you're referring to of, of just this more nebulous exemption of de-identified data which nobody would be able to feel comfortable with. So that's actually, I mean, that actually does give credence to the idea that this is the most protected data. I mean, there may end up being no data, data, data. Um, there may end up being no data at all um, because we're going to switch to the Google and Apple um, protocol. But, um, but the fact that that's the first time that has actually been legislated and it's been acknowledged in legislation, that de-identification doesn't just mean that the um, other protections don't apply. That actually is pretty significant. That could have a continuing value as a precedent. Um, so I'd like to fi finish with a question from Damien Clifford. Um, so Damien's question is essentially that um, he, he points out that in Europe, when you're thinking about uh, using personal data, that I can't say it consistently. Um, I just, there's just a, a, a random number operator in my brain that decides whether I'm going to say data or data next time. <laughs> Um, so in Europe, when you're deciding whether to use um, personal data, you can appeal to a pub, a, an individual consent legitimation, 
or you can appeal to a public interest legitimation. Um, and I think that um, if you look at the sort of the recent work over the last 10, 15 years um, on um, how to sort of, I guess, update privacy thinking in the light of big data, there's been a um, really almost, I, I would say now universal move away from the sort of the, the privacy self-management model, the idea that notice and consent is sufficient. Anybody who clicked through on any number of cookie notifications um, without reading it all and who just is sick of the whole thing by now um, would recognize this. Also, you know, with something like COVID safe, the, the risks, many of the risks are not necessarily um, individual risks. They're sort of collective risks. Many of the benefits are obviously collective benefits. It's, it's a collective action problem. You know, you, you, you need everybody to, to, to do it, but you personally, you're gonna be made better off if everybody else has the app and you don't, then you get all the benefits, but you don't get, the, um, you don't get any of the costs. So that's the, the definition of a collective action problem. Um, so Damien's question then is, are we, are we making a mess of the discussion around consent generally in the context of um, uh, COVID safe? by suggesting that large scale public uses of data can never be legitimized by consent, um, as opposed to, um, <laughs> as opposed to um, thinking about the public interest um, generally. Um, okay, so Meru has to go, because um, she's got another call to go on to. Um, thank Hi, you very James. much, Meru. Thanks very much, everyone. It was thank great you. to have you. Um, okay, so for the rest of you, so um, do you, ha when you're thinking about this, um, what prominence do you think should be given to individual consent versus the public interest? And maybe you could each use this as an opportunity to just sort of give your closing thoughts. So Catherine, would you mind starting? Um, yes, I think here there's a fundamental difference between our uh, approach to privacy law in Australia and um, the approach in jurisdictions like the EU, where there is the recognition of legitimate interest as an alternative basis um, to consent as a justification for dealing with somebody's personal data. And it's not um, a justification that can translate easily to Australia for this reason. Um, in the EU, where you can say that I don't have this person's consent, but I'm re re relying on the legitimate interest justification, you then have to go through the process of balancing the legitimate interest against that person's fundamental right to privacy, as I was speaking about earlier, and, and then working out that, that question of the necessity and the proportionality and so forth. We don't have a fundamental right to privacy in Australia where we could um, then create a similar legal test to that which exists in the EU at the moment. There is no um, way that we could directly adopt uh, the same kind of uh, justification. So in Australia, there tends to be more reliance on consent and yet currently under our privacy laws, that consent can even be implied consent. It's just that you have a privacy policy and therefore it's implied that somebody's agreed to that. So really in a lot of ways, Australia's privacy law has got to catch up. And if we want to be able to look at those alternative justifications, it would require major changes to, to our framework for privacy, data privacy regulation. Um, we're not close to that yet. Uh, my, my final thoughts were, would be um, when we're talking about that possibility of the GAPL approach, there's Clearly, there's some problems with us allowing uh, these companies with their private economic power to determine the standards for us um, when these are clearly not elected bodies. And at the same time, we have the problem that uh, the Australian government can't be held to, the, to account in the same way as in other countries if they subsequently pass a law that degrades our privacy in a way that's not reasonable, um, not necessary and proportionate having regard to our fundamental right to privacy because we don't have that um, same fundamental right to privacy as other jurisdictions. So the government may need to move um, further in the direction of Google and Apple. That's very, that's great, thank you. James, do you have any last thoughts? Um, it's, I, I'm trying to, trying to summarize my thoughts. I mean, around the, the 
the privacy aspect, I mean, I guess you've got this sort of public health imperative versus individual kind of rights situation. And, and I think it's hard to say what that is at the moment. In, in a sense, in Australia now, we have very few cases and we don't actually feel particularly at risk of um, a COVID expansion right now. So I think in, in a sense, it, you could argue it's, it's time to be kind of cautious. Also, the, 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 the data from the app will actually be of very little use right now in terms of uh, we've got so few cases we, we learn about so that to, to me the value in the data isn't really about um, from from a public health point of view isn't really about the individual aspects of it it's more the statistical properties of aggregation of this that could be useful and in terms of advancing our understanding of control and also the transmission and i guess control is the thing that you could say is a public health um, imperative the the transmission stuff's probably more fun for us modelers but may actually not necessarily advance uh, our public health measures so much so um i mean i i have no expertise in terms of the sort of the decisions about apple that apple and so on have made i mean it to me it it seems a little um, prissy of them to determine these sorts of um, technologies when they are collecting lots of data on us through other mechanisms and seem quite happy to use that for commercial purposes. Um, but I recognise that in some ways there's differences in terms of how we view it as individual choices. Um, so I suppose I'm a little bit on the fence. I know people have been asking about COVID safe. I, I have no problem saying I've downloaded COVID safe. I've, I've got it on my phone. My problem is I tend to, my phone tends to run out of charge and I, I sort of leave it in my car and all these sorts of things. So I'm, I'm a bad implementer of, of, of a technology. So I think, I think there's lots of problems with assuming that, that, that apps are going to be a quick technological fix. They're not, they're nowhere near as good as something like a vaccine, which you can kind of go to the doctor once, get immunized and, you're protected, right? The app is like so much less useful than, than something like that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think one of the things that's really striking me about this, so one, so one, on the one hand, there's the fact that ultimately the decision as to what approach we're going to take to weighing pub public health and privacy has been taken um, by executives at um, Google and Apple who aren't accountable to us through any kind of democratic process. They've done so in a way that I think has been genuinely um, kind of uh, well-intentioned and they've tried to sort of follow their moral reasons for a good part. I genuinely believe that there is the, the people who have arranged this um, this collabor collaboration did so from the right motivations. I also think the one thing that we haven't mentioned that's really important is that they are sort of um, in, to some degree required to sort of apply a lowest common denominator to what they apply because ultimately if they wanted to give a sort of an exemption because they trusted Australia with more data um, then how would they prevent a country that they didn't have so much confidence in their, in their institutions um, and, you know, <laughs> up the scale to those countries that can be even better trusted with public data than Australia, which is obviously many. Um, so I think one of the challenges they face is that they wanted to roll out something that would be um, kind of work for everybody um, and, uh, and avoid them having to kind of pick champions. Um, that just to me, again, illustrates the fact that, um, you know, that, that, Things needn't be that case. We could have a great deal more kind of national sovereignty over our technological infrastructure. Um, it's something that is perfectly achievable. It's again, um, an indicator of the political side of this. The other dimension I think is, um, it's super interesting to me that we just can't know a bunch of this stuff and there's information that we can't have, but that the tech companies can have um, in regard to this. Um, and I think that that sort of inequality in information is itself as important as the inequality in power. Um, but for the last words, um, I'd like to go to Vanessa. Vanessa, what are your um, your concluding thoughts? Wow, there's so much to answer in the last few minutes. Um, first of all, I don't think our government is doing a great job of democratic or privacy respecting processes here. So we haven't had, it's all very well, I sort of agree in principle that it's not nice for tech companies to be making these decisions. On the other hand, the citizenry hasn't had a good chance to make decisions about this. We haven't had coherent messaging about what the app is doing. We haven't had a genuine debate about whether we should switch to a decentralized model. We haven't even had basic accurate communication about what data the app collects and uploads. For example, the reason that a lot of Australians think that it only retains contacts of more than 15 minutes and one and a half and less than one and a half meters is because that's what it says in the FAQ on the app. But it's completely untrue. It logs everything. So 
Although I sort of agree that it doesn't feel nice to have the tech companies protecting the citizens from data invasion by our own government and that that's all back to front and wrong. On the other hand, I don't think that allowing the elected authority to grab whatever data they like is necessarily a good idea either. I'd be much happier with that if we had a much more robust democratic process here and much more coherent messaging. We don't even know what's in the encrypted pings that COVID safe encourages us to send out constantly, right? We don't have, we know what they are in Singapore, we know what they are in the UK, in Australia, we haven't got a clue. So, I think in the discussion between our centralised and our decentralised model, what we have is one of these absolutely fundamental political questions about, not about public health versus individual privacy, but about centralised authority versus individual agency. So I've heard Meru, it's sad that, um, it's ha it's sad that Meru isn't here anymore, but she spoke up, I think, very articulately and very confidently for the opportunities associated with a benevolent, trustworthy, well-functioning and trusted central authority. And if that was exactly what we had, then that would be great. But at least some number of Australians, including me, experienced the downside of central information aggregation. The decentralised model emphasises the risk in the case that that authority might be incompetent, that their server might go down, that they might leak the data, that they might post it on the web in de-identified form without realising how easily identifiable it is. The decentralised model emphasises individual agency against the risk that the central authority malfunctions. So this fundamental political question is not going to go away and we're not going to get a quick answer this afternoon. Yeah, no, but I, I think that's what we've got. I mean, I think the, the ideal would be if you could have the decentralized architecture that was then sharing the data solely with the health authority and that that could then be protected from the, um, so the state and territory health authorities, and then that could be protected from the uh, federal government entirely. Uh, I think that's probably where I would land as a, as a preferred model. I know that's not probably where you would land either. Uh, I, I'd, I'd, I'd land with opt-in yeah. individual sharing. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Look, so I now have to do that thing at the end of the Zoom call where you awkwardly try and figure out how to end it on, on the screen, um, which we've all been doing a hundred times over the last um, last few months. Thank you all so much. Yeah, I know, but I still got to do the click and then the click. Yeah, yeah. It's Shelley telling me how to do it. Um, so um, thank you all so much. That was really interesting. Um, so for those of you who are still on, we're going to put up some resources on the, the HMI um, Twitter feed. We'll link to the video as soon as it goes out. Thank you to Shelley, uh, Shelley Adamson for um, organizing this and to Lisa Crocker from the Academy of Science. Um, thank you to the Academy of Science for their co-sponsorship and their um, helping with the publicity. Um, that's all we have. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, it was great talking to you and let's see what happens next. Thanks, sir, for having us.